All right, hello everyone and welcome to the Philosophy of Fitness podcast, episode number 22. My name is Haley, I'm gonna be your host today and every single day that you are tuning in. Today I am joined with sober yoga girl, Alex McGrobs, all the way from Dubai, welcome. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. I am so excited to have you on. Um, We were just saying before this, I really feel like the sober, curious, you know, alcohol-free movement is really starting to gain some traction now. So it's always nice to kind of see other people that are on that path. And funny enough, I didn't even realize when I scheduled this, but this is my nine-month mark of alcohol-free. So this is like perfect timing. That's huge. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, super exciting. So I guess we'll kind of just like dive right into it. I'm so curious to hear what your background is, what kind of pushed you in the direction of saying that you didn't want alcohol to be a part of your life. So I'd love to hear your journey. Yeah. Um, so I am here in, well, I'm actually in Abu Dhabi, which is just an hour outside of Dubai. Um, but most people know Dubai, so I often go with that. Um, but I'm originally from Toronto. And I grew up in the North American culture or the culture of my community growing up was um, very oriented around alcohol. Um, It wasn't like, it wasn't like my family was drinking to excess at all. They were drinking responsibly, but alcohol was part of all of our family occasions and gatherings and, you know, weekends and that kind of snowballed into my teenage years. I just became like a pretty big party girl. Um, And then I went out to university and it just kind of continued from there. Um, And I would say I was able to kind of like really gain an awareness around the role alcohol played in my life, specifically when I moved abroad, when I moved to the Middle East. So I moved here six years ago. And before I lived in the UAE, I actually lived in a country called Kuwait, tiny country. Um, Yeah, it's in between Iraq and Saudi Arabia. And in Kuwait, alcohol is completely illegal. And during my time there, I like really started to, it became clear my, um, the way alcohol played a role in my life um, because everything became about, you know, like how could I drink? How could I party? How could I go out with people? And then like, how could I fly out of Kuwait for the weekend so that I could have access to alcohol? And you know, being on the plane was a whole drinking ritual. Like it became really um, kind of central to my life in a really negative way to the point where I actually look back and I think I was like unhappy in Kuwait because alcohol was illegal, you know? Like I wonder what my experience would be like of that country now being a sober person, I don't know. But anyway, so all of that was kind of going on and then I moved to Abu Dhabi, um, which, is kind of like the glitz and glamour party scene of the region and so it's normal to come here and start drinking at like noon on a friday which is like the weekend for us and people are drinking all night until like midnight and so i kind of got swept up into that culture ladies night brunches and it was like a year of it just getting worse and worse and like the problem here is that like it's completely normal to be like binge drinking it's completely normal to like go out partying on a tuesday so it's not like i was doing anything abnormal but i just um it was just like kind of taking a hold of my life um so i ended up going alcohol free about i I think i'm over like 500 five something days i honestly completely lose track and i'm i'm wrong all the time when i (laughs) end the day because i just have no idea anymore yeah Um, (laughs) that's awesome Yeah. And so when I originally quit drinking, it was not at all that I was quitting forever. I was like, I'm going to take a month off. And then not long into it, I was like, wow, I really need to make this longer. Like I need to be 90 days. And then by the time I hit something around 60, I was like, no, like I just need this out of my life forever. (laughs) Um, Yeah. And so it was kind of like a slow, I don't know what your experience was uh, with it, but for me, it was like kind of a slow build. Yeah, I have a very similar experience. Um, So like here in New York, it's the same kind of thing, like boozy brunch, you know, happy hour after work, um, Saturday, like day drinking, all that kind of stuff. Um, And like at the end of last year, I sort of just I like like discovered the law of attraction. I don't know if you're familiar with what it is, but I basically had like a spiritual awakening. And I think it kind of just coincided with that where I slowly started losing my taste for it. And I was like, you know what, I really just I don't really think I want this to be a part of my life anymore. So 
um, December 31st of last year was the day that I decided like, okay, I'm going to start with like a month like you. I was like, I'm just going to do like a dry January, see where it goes. Um, and then I, it kind of just became a lifestyle for me and I've felt so good. And now I'm like, I'm going to just keep this going. Like this feels right for me. So yeah. That's awesome that you started on new year's. Yeah. That's I started amazing. the day before, which is really funny. Cause most people would like do it. Cause I even remember like the last time I drank was, um, at a Zed concert in, uh, Brooklyn. I was with my friends and I was like, you know what, this is the last time. Like I, I'm tired of, you know, waking up hungover and being bloated and just I, for a multitude of reasons. I mean, even health wise, like, um, it held me back in a lot of ways. So I feel so much better now that it's not a part of the equation. And I'm sure you do too. Yeah. Oh my God. It was like a game changer. Like I had no idea what it was like. Cause I was drinking almost every night of the week. Like I wasn't getting drunk, but I was like, had a glass of wine with dinner most nights. And then I was partying on the weekend and maybe once a week on a ladies night. And I just had no idea what it was like to wake up like well rested. I had no idea. And to actually want to get out of bed and like, I get up and I drive down the highway as like the sun is rising in the winter. So it was winter at that point. And I drive by Sheikh Zayed Grand Mosque, which I think is like the most beautiful building in the world. And in my first 60 or so days sober, like I swear I would <laughs> almost even like tearing up thinking of it. I would look to my right and see the mosque and be like, oh my God, life is so beautiful. <laughs> you know? And like, That's awesome. Yeah. Don't know when you're perpetually hung over how much it affects you until you remove it from the equation. You're just like, wow. <laughs> yeah. It's like you start to appreciate the little things even more. Like, yeah, I know for me, like at the height of like my party days was like in college. And a big part of it too is like, I would have a few drinks and then I would need to make a snack. So for me, it was just like a calorie catastrophe usually. So I would always, I would be in my kitchen at 3 a.m., you know, making nachos after a night out and then rolling into bed and like wondering why I felt so horrible the next day. And it was just, it's so normalized in Western society, I feel like. And it sounds like it kind of is there too, that it's like, you're not technically doing anything out of the norm, but it's so crazy to think that you're basically putting your body through like a yeah. war zone every weekend, you know? And you know, what's fascinating too, being an expat is like seeing things from different perspectives. So I was out to dinner the other night with, um, like I was very much in a party scene here, but there's people from like all over the world here and the local people drinking is generally not part of their culture. So drinking is very covert here. You know, like you drink in a dark wine glass as opposed to in a clear one. Like it's very, it's oh, not wow. pushed on us the same way in the West. And um, I have an Emirati friend who I was out to dinner with and she was like, I just don't understand. Like, what's the whole sober coaching thing? Like, she's like, I just never wanted to drink. And she, you know, could tell me one story from her life when someone had pressured her to drink. And it was when she had like traveled to Europe and been around European teenagers. And so for her, it just seems so strange that I'm like, no, sober coaching is actually a huge thing. Like people who are transitioning out of alcohol, they're like, might, it might change their friend group. It might change who their relationship is with, it might be tough on their family. And for her, that was just so unrelatable because alcohol was not part of her childhood. And I just thought that was really interesting to see how significant it is in the Western world. Yeah, that is super interesting. And that kind of reminded me. So I studied abroad in Italy when I was in college. Okay. And uh, everyone knows, you know, American students abroad, it's like drinking every night kind of thing. But it was really funny to see because all of the locals, like, at least in Italy, it's not a part of the culture to be partying all the time. Like, people don't view alcohol the same way there uh, that they do in the U.S. It's much more tame, which was really kind of eye-opening to see uh, when I was there. Mm -hmm. Drinking more um, responsibly. I mean, yeah. when I was in Italy, I was 16, and I was also drunk every night on, like, a high school trip. So I don't yeah. think I was... <laughs> cognizant of that like that aspect of the culture I was too drunk to <laughs> <notice>. <laughs> yeah it was crazy because like the group of people that I was with we would be like going out on a Tuesday night and like no one else was to be found in the bars like it was all just American students so it kind of made you think hmm like something's different here and I wonder if it's because alcohol is legal for people at a younger age there I sometimes wonder if that's a part of it 
Mm -hmm. um, where they've just, it's not like emphasized so much as a, as a party culture. Yeah. Yeah. So interesting. Yeah. So I'm kind of curious, um, what exactly is it that brought you to, uh, Kuwait in the first place? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, this kind of goes into my, uh, my yoga journey. (laughs) (laughs) Um, so I, um, did my, I was doing my undergraduate degree and, um, in Canada. And I actually did a concurrent program, which is a bachelor of arts, bachelor of education at the same time. And at that time I was like really struggling with my mental health. Um, and probably a large factor of that was my partying, (laughs) which I could not see. And, um, I kind of came to yoga as a spiritual practice, like innately, like I was like drawn to it. Um, actually beginning as a young child, like when I was 10, I asked my mom to like, take me to yoga for kids. So it was kind of a thing oh, really? all the time. Yeah. And then yoga for teens when I was like 14. Um, but when I got to university, that's when I got like seriously pulled towards it. And then I started doing yoga every day, sometimes two times a day. And I became, I was working at the yoga studio, um, like cleaning the studio and working at the front desk. And then I became, I went to Mexico, did my yoga teacher training. I was like the youngest person there. I think I was 21, came back and started oh, teaching wow. yoga. I told my parents, I just want to be a yoga teacher forever. Um, That was all I wanted to do. And I think there were like, so I was just going to stay in Canada and teach yoga at this studio. And I think there were like a ton of things looking back that changed my mind. Um, For me, I think part of me was like very afraid of having like an untraditional career, a bit like of insecurity. Like I didn't think I was good enough. And I also, my parents, no doubt, were, like, a huge factor. Like, they really wanted me to, like, get a real job, you know? And so um, they really wanted me to go into teaching. And teaching at the time that I graduated in Canada, I don't know if it's the same six years later, but at that point, there weren't really jobs for graduates because there was, like, a huge output in teachers and um, not enough positions available. So they were really, really pushing at my school, like, go abroad, go abroad, And then I had a mentor who had worked in Egypt for two years and he was like, Alex, it was amazing. Just go teach. And then if you don't like it, you can come back, you can quit, but like, at least you'll, um, you know, have tried it. And so it was kind of like that combination of things that very late in the game, I was like, like it was maybe March of that year. I was like, I guess I'll just apply to teach. And like all my friends had already gotten jobs, like, you know, signed in Dubai or signed in Mexico or whatever. And, um, So I started recruiting and uh, the opportunity kind of came up and I ended up having a lot of connections at the school where I got the offer from. Um, Like the principal was from my neighborhood and um, my mentor who was, who had worked in Egypt, his friends who he worked with in Egypt were actually now at that school in Kuwait. And it was just coincidental. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so it just kind of felt like the right choice for me. Um, And I had set out looking for jobs in South America, actually, which is like, the irony. I'm like, I don't know how I ended up in like, it's a country literally in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but once I got here, I've, I've kind of been looking back lately and I've realized that, um, I think I felt really tied to this, um, part of the world because there is like an element of, there's like similarities in, um, so Kuwait is very like authentically Arabic and there isn't a lot of tourism. And there's a lot of people that are like, practicing Muslims and you know in the middle of the day they'll start praying in the street type of thing and it was just I look back now and I'm like I see almost a parallel between like my yoga practice and like the energy of people practicing yoga in a room together can be paralleled with like that spirituality that I would see um if that makes sense like all around me yeah And so I feel like I immediately felt like at home in this continent, um, whereas Kuwait was not necessarily my like forever home, but definitely within the Middle East. Um, And that kind of just opened my eyes. Like I had so many opportunities to travel to places like Egypt and Jordan and Lebanon, places that I would never even know where they were. Um, I never would think in my lifetime, like I would see the pyramids of Giza, you know, or the Taj Mahal, like it just would, was not something that part of my childhood, like we did not really leave North America, um, other than, yeah. you know, the occasion out to Italy, um, 
like it was not, I never thought I would come to Asia in my life. And so, um, yeah, that's kind of kept me here for, uh, for, yeah, it's been six years. I set out saying two year contract and here I am. Wow. Like one more year. (laughs) That's so exciting though. I, I love that. Yeah. And so while I've been here, I've kind of lost and found yoga again. Um, it wasn't very present in Kuwait. Um, but in Abu Dhabi, um, we have a better kind of yoga scene and I kind of lost it a little bit with my partying, got back into it again. And then, um, kind of in the spirituality, um, same thing you said, like spiritual awakening around sobriety. Like I would say I was going through something like that. And, um, now I'm kind of, I'm wrapping up probably my last year of teaching as my business is kind of really taking off and I'm really focusing my kind of energy on that. Yeah, that's amazing. You're doing some awesome stuff with, um, sober coaching, which I think is really cool because I mean, when I, when I decided to quit it, there was nobody kind of like mentoring me. It was just like a decision that I made. Um, and it is challenging. I will say like, it's definitely, Uh, a challenging road, but I kind of think that the COVID situation made it easier in a way because, you know, people couldn't go to bars and there was less of that kind of like atmosphere. Um, But I think it is important to kind of have someone guiding you along the way. So would you have any tips for people um, starting out if they're, you know, thinking about maybe ditching alcohol? Yeah. um, Yeah. What tips would I give? I would say, um, definitely like surround yourself with kind of people that will cheer you on and support you. Um, immerse yourself in like all the resources you can. Like when I first quit, I only found kind of one group online or one resource. And I felt like that was like the only one. And it's interesting, the longer I'm in the sober world, the more I see like how many incredible like voices there are out there. There's like so many books, there's so many people on Instagram. Um, and I think like surrounding yourself with as much as possible to help you like keep on that track is key. Um, and then, yeah, as you mentioned, like having someone to talk to you about it. Um, I ended up having someone in coaching, uh, coaching me when I quit, um, for, I think about the first, I want to say maybe 60, 70 days. Um, I met with someone every week and I found that hugely beneficial because there's just like things that come up. Like, unfortunately I had friends that I'm no longer friends with, um, because alcohol was like the key factor in our relationship. Um, you know, you go on dates where people are like pressuring you to drink with them. Um, there's like so many things that can arise, like navigating how to tell like the people you're close to, um, there's so much more than just quitting the drink. And um, I think sometimes people have misconceptions around what I do. Um, Like people, I've had someone, some people react being like, oh, well, you're not like a trained substance abuse counselor. You know what I mean? And I feel like Mm -hmm. they miss the whole idea of like what it really is, which is like sober lifestyle coaching to help people realign their whole life right so it's not necessarily people that have addictions per se um it can be um but it's it's really just about like making a change and like having kind of a cheerleader in your corner to like help you uh keep going yeah i think that's an important distinction to make because i feel like sometimes when people say alcohol free or sober curious they automatically will associate it with someone that's had an addiction and that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Like there's a lot of people who, like you said, it's such a growing community. I feel like of people who have just decided that, um, it doesn't resonate with them anymore. And they're really trying to align with a healthier lifestyle. Um, and it, it can be a separate thing. Like for me, I'm not somebody who, you know, suffered with addiction and that's such an incredible struggle. And it's such an amazing thing that people who are overcoming that every single day. But like you said, there's a space too, for people who, are just looking to kind of eliminate it from their life um, for a multitude of reasons. So Mm -hmm. I think it's important to make that distinction, you know? Totally, totally. And I, that has been a conscious choice of mine is using the word sober because I do think it's stigmatized in the sense that, and I, I also think that people have a lack of understanding about the kind of spectrum of addiction, um, right? Like people seem to think like either you're an addict or you're not. 
Um, and like, I, I use the word sober and I also like, like to identify, like explain, like, you know, you can be on this scale and like, I was not necessarily at the end of like waking up drinking in the morning, but like maybe if I had kept on my way of daily drinking, like maybe I would like move towards that. Right. And so like, I think there's a big, um, as you said, like a broad kind of variety of people's different relationships with alcohol. And I think the word sober, we should be turning it into like a positive thing. Yes, absolutely. I totally agree with that. I do feel like there, it carries a lot of weight and judgment, which it shouldn't because people are trying to make a healthy change. That should be something that's celebrated, not kind of um, frowned upon. So I do think people need to, to talk about it more too, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm kind of curious, like switching gears a little bit. um, Do you think that yoga has had like an impact on you wanting to ditch alcohol? I think hmm, that's a good question. You know, when I was on my yoga teacher training, so I've done two of those intensive um, teacher trainings where I've been like a month in Mexico and then a month in Bali. And on both those trainings, alcohol wasn't allowed. Like we weren't supposed to consume it the whole time. And on both those trainings, I snuck off the property on my days off and drank. Um, And so I was around people all the time that were saying like the negative effects of alcohol. And even like my teacher from my third yoga teacher training, I had read his books um, and he had recovered from an addiction and he was writing about sobriety. And for some reason it like was not resonating with me. I don't know if yoga, I don't know if yoga influenced my wanting to quit alcohol, but definitely my purpose in life has always been to be teaching yoga and to be a healer. And I think alcohol hindered me from that. It held me back from that potential. And I think if I continued, like, I think it, things kind of go both ways, right? I was drinking because I was so unhappy with my life the way it was. Um, but I also think that if I never stopped drinking, then I would have never been able to have the momentum to like make the change, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I quit in April of last year. And then uh, I went through a really positive kind of period of time where I was so happy. And then I kind of hit a depression again of like, wow, I'm sober now. I'm still not happier. Something needs to change. And I actually went to see a psychic in Dubai. Um, and he was kind of the key turning point for me. Um, because he, I walked in and he said, you know, close your eyes, count backwards from 21 to one, open your eyes, open my eyes. And he said, um, you're not meant to be a school teacher. You're meant to be a healer. And, uh, I just got chills. Yeah. And I was crying the whole time. And and he said, you know, you're meant to open this like yoga center. You're meant to be a life coach. Um, You're meant to just be doing that full time. And hearing him say that to me, like he saw within me what was always there, you know, like six years ago, I wanted to do yoga full time and something for some reason was holding me back. And he saw that what was always there. And it was that conversation that kind of turned everything for me, you know, because I just became so fixated on my growth and building my business. And it pretty much all came, he kind of lit this match. Um, but I definitely like carried the torch and, uh, yeah, from that is what came the mindful life practice, which is my virtual yoga studio. Um, so I have that online community. We have about 15 instructors there and, we had teach live classes, um, on zoom. And then we also record them so that they're on demand, um, to play afterwards. Um, and then that community is kind of open to everyone like sober, not sober, anyone from all over the world. Um, whereas the sober girls yoga is kind of a little program within the mindful life practice. And that's ex- specifically for sober women. Um, and so we do yoga practices and meditations, uh, geared around sobriety and we do some challenges to help women quit alcohol. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that kind of all came from, from that conversation, which is pretty cool. 
That's, that is so cool. It's always funny. Like when you kind of can take a step back and connect the dots of like what led you to where you are. And it's really funny what you said about the psychic because back, I think it was in January, I also went to a psychic um, and they told me something similar too. like, they told me you're a healer. You have to tap into so much more of like what you have to offer. And that was a similar thing for me where it was kind of like a wake up call to start my own path. And a couple months after that, I started this podcast and I'm in the process of like starting my own programs now. So it is really funny sometimes where it just takes like that one, someone recognizing it in you. And then, like you said, carrying that torch on. It's like, I always say when you're really passionate about something, it's kind of like an alarm clock going off in your head that Mm -hmm. no matter how many times you try to snooze it out, like it just keeps coming back. And it sounds like for you, yoga was sort of that way because it was kept popping up uh, throughout your lifestyle. So it's kind of cool when you can connect the dots and see how everything has sort of led you to where you are and even learning through the process of why alcohol doesn't resonate with you and how that's kind of led you on onto your true purpose. That's crazy. I do believe in psychics. I do think that um, some people are tapped into something. Yeah. You know what? I actually was not a believer before I ended up meeting this guy. Um, I was just so like lost. And one of my colleagues, she's been talking about him like for years. She's like the psychic, the psychic. And finally, I was like, you know what, I'm gonna go see your psychic. <laughs> and I like didn't know what to expect. And now I 100% believe in it. I think that it doesn't really matter what his method is. His goal is to help people kind of see within themselves um, their true potential. And if like, if whatever heals you, um, I'll never judge, you know, Reiki, yeah. psychic, whatever. As long as it heals the individual, um, then I'm all for it. Yeah, that's a good point, too, is like not to judge because different people have different ways that um, that they find healing. Like some people, it's tarot readings, like you said, Reiki. Um, I know people that swear by Reiki and crystal healing and stuff. Um, So different things, you know, it's whatever is going to kind of like pull it out of you. Um, And everyone's different. Everyone has, you know, person A could want to do this and then person B has a totally different method. But, you know, whatever helps you like recognize your potential, I Like you said, I'm all for it. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So another question that I have, I ask everybody that comes on the show. um, And it's interesting because everybody has a very different um, take on it. And I'm kind of curious, like what your take is on the mind body connection. Mind body connection. Um, I see it. uh, I see the mind and body like deeply tied. Um, and I think that our emotional experiences and our traumatic experiences and any of our experience really live physically within us. Um, and it's extremely evident when, cause I've been teaching yoga for so long and the number of people that I've seen in pigeon pose, like a deep hip opening pose, um, come to tears in classes. The amount of times I've come to tears in that pose, um, it's like, it can't be pure coincidence, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. The hips are like the junk drawer, um, our emotional Mm -hmm. junk drawer. It kind of stores all of our pain. And when you start opening and release it, releasing it, it kind of starts, I don't know, bubbling to the surface and then, and then coming out. Um, everyone has different hot spots in the body, but another one for me is like the traps muscles. That's where things Mm -hmm. live. Um, and I can, again, like I can think of times when I've been in yoga classes and you like, you're holding this stretch and then you're just like brought to emotional, you know, and you don't even know what or why. Yeah. Um, and I think that we, misunderstand as a society like how deeply tied these two aspects of us are um but i think we can't be healed in one without being healed in the other and that's why having something like a yoga practice is so essential because it um you know like i i had done talk therapy for years as a young person, but it wasn't until I fully like integrated and maintained that yoga practice that it really, it's like a piece of the pie chart. You know, you have different pieces of the pie chart with your well being, And, um, yeah, I think mind and body connection is, is strong. I like the pie chart analogy. That's a good way of putting it. 
Yeah. Um, and it's true. That's actually so interesting about um, pigeon pose and also what you're talking about with your traps. Like stress will always, I always think of it as kind of like a backpack that you carry around mm-hmm. and whatever you're feeling, if you're not like releasing it or talking it through, like it's going to inevitably store itself in the body. Like I know for me, like when I feel really stressed out, like my chest feels tight and my palms are sweaty and like, those are my kind of cues that I'm stressed and I need to kind of address whatever it is that I'm going through. So, um, it sounds like even yoga though, I, I really do need to get more into yoga, but it sounds like it kind of gets like, um, to a deeper level of like healing stuff that we've maybe been carrying around like for years and we may not even know that we're holding on to. Yeah, I think 100%. Um, like for myself, at least it's, um, you know what it is? It's like the mindfulness practice that is woven into it, right? Because it's so much about the breath and the movement with the breath and controlling the breath. And, um, there's science behind, um, the way that we control the breath, um, being able to move us from like an anxious state to a more calm state. And then once you kind of arrive in this mindfulness practice, it's not just simply exercise, you know? And so, um, it, it becomes a really, it's very, um, a very holistic practice, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Like you said, it's, it's a pie chart. It's everything is connected together. So it's like whenever we're feeling something emotionally, there's usually probably going to be something, uh, that corresponds with it physically. Um, and like, like you kind of said, I think it's like getting it out of your body and like releasing it through a physical way is such a more healing way of thinking of it than just like, you know, talking it through with somebody, like actually releasing it from your body. Cause I don't know about you, but like when I'm really feeling, uh, you know, a slew of negative emotions, I literally feel like I'm carrying that weight with me. Yeah. Yeah. Mind body connection. (laughs) Yep. Yeah. It's, it's everything I'm telling you. That's why I started this podcast, like philosophy of fitness. Like I've come to understand how much our mindset can affect, um, what we do physically and especially with workouts. And I think a big part of that too, for me was, uh, cutting alcohol out. It held me back, you know, physically, mentally, spiritually. And once I decided to not have it be a part of my life, I, I got in the best shape of my life. I was able to do things I never thought I could do like physically, you know, running and cycling, lifting heavier, whatever it might've been. Um, it was kind of that realization of how much it was all connected and also just your internal dialogue too. Yeah. Speaking more kindly to yourself. Oh, hundred percent. The inner dialogue is like massive. Yeah. And sometimes <laughs> you're not even aware of it. Like I remember when I first got really into yoga, um, 10 years ago now, which is crazy. Um, I was going to a studio that had mirrors in the front of the room. And I remember going into the classes and like spending all this time just thinking such negative thoughts about my body. I would just be sitting, looking in the mirror, thinking all these bad things (laughs) and just like putting myself down. And like, you don't even notice that that's going on, um, while you're in it, you know, uh, it's only in reflection that you're like, that was, okay. That was not a positive (laughs) way to spend my time, you know? Um, yeah. And it's becomes a conscious effort to like, intervene with those thought loops and, um, and kind of replace them with a more positive thought. Yeah. I was the same way. I remember like so many times, you know, in high school, I'd look in the bathroom mirror and, you know, just, it was just like every little dig you could make at yourself. And like, no one else was doing that. Um, it was all me and I carried that with me for a long time. And it's, it's something that I think is still a a challenge, uh, for me and for a lot of people. Um, but in my opinion, like we train our bodies, you know, we train our muscles in our bodies. So why don't we think of our mind as a muscle? Because basically it's the same kind of thing. Like over time you have to train it to like reframe that internal dialogue and it takes time to kind of chip away and like reprogram. Um, so I think more people need to look at our, our mind as a muscle. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. I love that. Like it takes time to retrain the mind and that's exactly what it was. It was retraining years of like negative patterns and limiting beliefs and, um, habits, um, just like correcting them or not correcting them, but, uh, 
I guess striving to to improve them would be better. Yeah, <laughs> it never be perfect. And like, but- Yeah. And like becoming aware of it too. I feel like awareness is such a big first step. Um, Even when like negative self-talk kind of comes up, it's like, okay, I'm aware like this is going on. Why, why am I saying this to myself? Like, how can I kind of move past it? Like whenever I feel myself slipping into some kind of negative self-talk, I try to kind of flip it around to something that I'm grateful for. And that'll usually set my mind on a different path so that I'm not dwelling on, you know, whatever it might have been that I'm beating myself up for, for no reason. (laughs) Yeah. So the Mindful Life Practice community is kind of my first uh, little baby. (laughs) Um, And so this kind of began out of um, COVID. And we actually, um, yes, we didn't exist six months ago. And when coronavirus started, um, I started offering online classes on zoom, um, like a lot of fitness professionals and it just grew really, really quickly. Um, our community grew largely. Um, it also became very international very quickly because I've taught abroad for so long that, you know, I have clients like a former client in Kuwait, who's now living in Montreal. Um, and you know, someone from Abu Dhabi who's now in Australia. And so it just kind of became very, that was, is what became very unique about it very quickly. Um, and so we actually what started was on april 1st i was like i'm going to do a 30-day yoga challenge and i had like 40 people sign up for that challenge which was amazing and then um i hit a point on like april 8th where i was like i'm so tired i was offering two yoga classes a day um i just could not keep it up so i was like you know maybe i'll invite a couple friends to like sub for me uh and then throughout the month of april i just had guest teachers here and there um and then it just kind of snowballed into like a fully kind of operational virtual yoga studio. Um, so we have like five live classes a day on Zoom um, and then wow. record them all on demand. And then our clients can um, stream them on the website. And then every month we offer a 30 day yoga challenge. And I have actually probably like five or six clients that have done every single one. So they are like six 30 day <laughs> yoga challenges, which is unbelievable. I don't even wow. know how many days that is, 180. Um, which is really cool. Am I doing that yeah. math right? Six times three. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so bad at math. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. Um, and so that is kind of um, that. And so with coming to our yoga classes, we offer a free trial week. Um, and then um, people can draw either do drop-ins. They can buy five class pass, 10 class pass, um, unlimited membership. Um, we have one for just on-demand classes and then the live classes. Um and we also have other things on the schedule. I'm also a bar instructor. Um, so I teach bar oh, okay. twice a week. Yeah. Um, and we have a Pilates instructor. Um, I lead meditations. What else do we have? Um, we do all different kinds of yoga, like yoga nidra, yin yoga, vinyasa, um, hatha. So yeah, it's a really great mix. Um, yeah. And then what kind of naturally happened as well was my sober work um, on the side. So I um, became a life coach last July, I did my first coaching course. And I initially was just kind of like a life purpose, life balance coach. That's what I was doing. But I was also very open on my social media about being sober. So the majority of people um, who were coming to me were, um, you know, saying, you know, I'm here for life purpose or I'm here for life balance. And then most commonly it would hit a point where they'd say, actually, I really want to work on my relationship with alcohol. And it was really interesting because I found that I was just drawing, um, people interested in sobriety. And so I was doing that for a while. And then I had one client who, you know, he got to like four months alcohol free and he wrote me a letter. And at the end of the letter, he said, thank you for saving my life. And I just kind of like had this emotional moment where I was in tears and I was like, this is what I'm meant to do. Like I'm meant to do sobriety. Um, and so I launched my sober programs. I want to say it's not more than a month ago. Um, and I already had, like, I fully sold out on my July, um, and my August coaching, which is amazing. So it just shows exactly. Yeah. It shows what you're saying about the, um, the sobriety wave, just like really building. Um, and so I do, a lot of private one-on-one sessions. Um, I have 
packages of four, eight, or 12, depending on like what the client is looking for. And then I also do a sober girls yoga group challenge every month. Um, so that integrates yoga and coaching. So we do a group coaching session once a week with a meditation and a check-in, um, and then like a theme discussion. And then the challenge is to give up alcohol for 30 days and commit to a daily yoga practice for 30 days. Um, and I have a couple of clients that are now going to be starting their 90 um, days with that. So that was, I started that two months ago. Um, so, so yeah, that's kind of like wow. an overview of what I do. Um, and I just have my one, like I'm still committed to my teaching contract right now. I have, you know, the rest of this school year. Um, so I'm staying committed to that. And then my intention going forward at the end of June is I'm hoping to, um, I just got approved to run yoga teacher trainings. So I'm hoping to launch my first trainings next summer. Um, hopefully in Bali, I'll be running a sober girl. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, a mindful life practice retreat and then a 200 hour yoga teacher training. Um, and that's set for July and August, 2021. That is so exciting. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have such a nice like array of so many different um, offerings of ways that people can better themselves. I think that's amazing. And like you said, too, um, I think that this is kind of just the start of this, uh, you know, sober wave movement, I think is going to really continue to gain traction. Like this seems like we're kind of at like the start of it now, sort of. And I feel like over the next like five to 10 years, I think it's it's really going to take off and people are going to, you know, realize uh, like you said before, I think before we started this, um, how people viewed smoking, uh, a, like in our previous generation where people are going to kind of view it as something that's like, wow, like that was something people just like did every day. Yeah. I think we're going to continue to kind of move away from it. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. So, um, where can people find this program? Where can they find you on social media? Any websites, uh, yeah. things you want to share? Yes. So, um, the mindful life practice, um, is our, is the name of my studio and we can be found at that website. Um, mindful, the mindful life practice.com. Um, and our Instagram handle is the MLPC. Um, the C is for community. Um, and that was kind of like an add on later on. Um, because I think that's like the biggest value of what we offer is like a strong international community. Um, and so that's the MLPC, um, and I'll share the link with you after. Um, and then for my sober work, um, I can be found at Alex McRobs, um, and my website has the same name, alexmcrobs.com. Yeah, beautiful. I love like everything that you're doing right now. I think it's so important, and I think you're very much like ahead of of what's going to be coming up. I really do feel like this is, this is a movement that's really just starting and I'm so excited to kind of see where it goes. And I'm excited too, for other people to kind of maybe try this out and see how it could help them. And I think that what you're offering is a great place to start to know that you're like supported through that journey, because like you said earlier, it's so much more than just ditching the alcohol. There's the social aspect, like relationships, family, friends, all of that. That's kind of all a part of the journey. So totally. Yeah. Well, thank you so much uh, for coming on. This has been amazing. Um, guys, I'm going to leave all of her links uh, in the descriptions and on the video as well. Remember, if you're listening, you can also watch the podcast on YouTube, youtube.com slash Haley Noel. But yes, Alex, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I loved it.